involved and help lead us and guide us into worship today. It is always a great day to be in the house of the Lord, to join together as the family of God, to come and worship our Heavenly Father who loves us so much. Following the service, there is a spaghetti meal that uh, you can, I guess, eat here or take it with you. But we encourage you to uh, take part in that, to help in that fundraising for uh, Joni, who will be going on mission trip. Is Joni here today? Good. I hadn't seen you. Good. So stick around. We want to pray for you right after the service, okay? Because you're leaving on Thursday? On the 28th. 28th. Okay. I was thinking earlier. So we're going to pray for you today as we, uh, as you continue to prepare and get your funds and pray that God continues to bless you in doing that, okay? And then uh, as we do that, we'll go ahead and say uh, a blessing for food for those of you that uh, Okay. All right. Well, a few weeks ago, we started a series called Back to the Basics. And our emphasis, as we were talking about that, was on prayer. <coughs> and the idea of prayer, prayer being our communication with God. The prayer is a very important, vital, <coughs> basic, fundamental belief that we adhere to, and it's something that is so crucial that we need to be in communication with God on a regular basis. The Word tells us that we are to pray without ceasing, that we are to be in a constant state, if you will, of prayer. Now, some of us may find that difficult to bow our heads and close our eyes as we're driving down the road, and we <laughs> encourage you not to do that. But... You can still, within your heart and spirit, be praying to our Heavenly Father. <coughs> because we have already acknowledged this morning that we can do nothing without Him. We can do nothing without the power and the presence of God through the Holy Spirit in our lives. But as we shared a couple of weeks ago, sometimes I think we have difficulty in this area because we are busy people. You know, let's face it, there's all kinds of things going on. <coughs> and it is difficult, perhaps, to find that quality time to spend in prayer with our Heavenly Father. And because of that, we become frustrated or we get discouraged in that perhaps our, our prayers aren't being affected. Our prayers aren't being acknowledged. And we talked about the fact that Unless we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, those prayers aren't being answered or acknowledged anyway. I believe that the scripture tells us, even though there's not a specific word-by-word -word commandment kind of verse that says, you know, if you're not praying at a specific time, if you're not born again, your prayers will not get answered. But if we take the counsel of the book as a whole, I believe the scripture tells us that unless we have a personal relationship with Christ, unless we have invited Christ to be part of our life, with that, with Jesus, there's change. Our lives are different. We are working towards becoming, as Paul said, more like Christ and less of ourselves than our prayer life can be more effective. And we went to the scripture to acknowledge that. Let's see, glasses in here. Let's pull up. Somewhere. To James chapter 5, verse 16, where it says, The prayer of a righteous man is powerful. And, effect. and we looked at the aspect of this idea of being righteous. 
Righteous being two phases that we've already talked about. The phase of having salvation. And then right living, which is the next slide. We talked about salvation in detail two weeks ago. Today we're going to talk about living rightly. Right living. 2 Peter 1, 10 through 11 reminds us that therefore, brothers, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. Because if you do these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be richly supplied to you. Now this idea of confirm your calling and election. Oftentimes in the scripture, the verb tense indicates an ongoing activity. Oftentimes we think that verb is just there and it's a one-time thing. It's not. Sometimes it is. But in this case, it's an ongoing thing. Because you see, as we strive to live right with God, on a daily basis, we should be working to confirm our calling and election. Now that doesn't mean that once we've been saved, we've invited Jesus into our Lord, that we lose our salvation. But it's saying that if we'll keep our mind, if we'll keep focused upon Jesus on a daily basis, then it helps us to stay strong, it helps us to develop and work into that personal relationship that we need to have with Him. That we confirm that calling, and election. Because if you do these things, you will never stumble. Now that doesn't mean that we uh, become sinless. It doesn't mean that we never mess up, because we do. But it does mean that the potential, you see, for never stumbling, never committing a sin, is there through the help of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. And if we are working very diligently every day to keep focused upon Him, then hopefully we are less likely to stumble and fall because Jesus is who we're focused on. So work every day to do that. Well, as we continue to talk about this living rightly, let's go to a familiar verse found in Romans chapter 12, and that is verses 1 through 2. It says, Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Let's dissect this verse a little. First of all, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. I don't know about you, but I am excited. In fact, the Word tells us that God's mercies are new each and every day. You see, what we're going to deal with today may not be the same thing that we will deal with tomorrow or the next day. But because Jesus' God's mercies are new each day, those mercies, that presence, that work of the Spirit is with us on a daily basis as long as we allow it to. The reality is God never goes anywhere. Do you understand? God cannot and does not love you any more than he loves you right now. It doesn't change. So if anything changes in that, guess who's doing it? We are. Exactly. We are. So the fact that we recognize that His mercies are new each and every day, God promises to be with us in every circumstance, to give us that help and guidance. So let's 
So he says, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, not many of us <laughs> like that word, sacrifice. Because it means we usually have to give up something. And it may be something that we think is very dear or we hold very dear. But when it comes to the, uh, in the scope of eternity, you know, it really doesn't matter anymore. And we have to decide if we're going to live for God, if we're going to be sold out for God, if we're going to present these bodies as living sacrifices, then we have to decide if it's worth it to give those things up and to focus upon Jesus wholeheartedly, to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and body. Because you see, when we do that, it says, holy and pleasing to God. We are to strive to be holy and pleasing to God. Excellent. It's difficult to do that. We live in a tough time. We live in a tough world. When, when we really look at it, probably the, the king of this world, though we know who's ultimately in charge, who's ultimately sovereign. But in reality, as we look around, the king of this world is not God. Because there is too much evil going on. And the church, the people of God, have decided that, you know, we'll be, we'll be tolerant. We'll be loving, and that's okay. But we are never commanded in this world to be so tolerant and so loving that we do not stand our ground for what is true and for what is right. And the church and the people of God have faltered and are faltering in that. We are called to be a holy people. To be set apart. And that's why it goes on to say, do not be conformed to this age. Some translations say world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Listen, we cannot leave the world. You know, we're here. We're physically present. We go to work every day. We take our sons and daughters to recreational activities and, and all those kinds of things. We are part of the world. So what he's talking about here is not a physical transformation. He's talking about a spiritual transformation. What we need to understand is if we have two sides, this side is the world, this side is without Christ, this side is perhaps following the devil and, and all the things that are going on, when we become saved, when we have asked Jesus to be part of our lives, then we decide that we want to be more like Christ, then Christ actively, spiritually, takes us from one side to the other. Christ, through the Spirit of God, spiritually picks us up, if you will, and carries us to the other side. To be set apart, different. And there's this line in between that separates that. And the sad part for us, guys, is that after Jesus is set apart, you know, a lot of this stuff, Satan makes appeal. You know, it's enticing. The scripture tells us that sin is pleasurable for a season. And the devil, Satan, knows where to tempt us, where our weaknesses are, and he makes all that stuff look appealing that, that we start perhaps inching back over there. And maybe in some way we, we think, well, you know, if I can get just close enough to that line, and I won't go over. But maybe I'll, I'll lean over. But, you know, I won't, I won't cross it. The 
problem with that is that when we get to that point, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. God, Christ, through his word, has given us guidelines to make sure that we stay on this side. That we are no longer conforming to this side spiritually. Though we have to be part of it physically, we do not want to be part of it spiritually. Can people tell a difference in you? If someone was to go up and ask somebody a question about you, do you believe so and so's Christian? Do do they act differently? Do they demonstrate Christ? You know, is their character, their integrity, what it should be? What would they say? That's a good test. That's a good test. The hopes are that because we are staying on this side, striving to live a right, holy, pleasing life to God, that there would be no question. There would be no stuttering, there would be no hesitation if they would say, yes. Yes, I have no doubt that they love the Lord. It is obvious, it is evident in their life. The neat thing about that is we talk about this aspect of prayer is that when we do that, there's, there's some reward. That reward is so that we may discern what is the good, pleasing, perfect will of God. And you want to know why that's good? Let's go to the next slide. John 14, 14. Here's the, the apostle John who walked with Christ on a daily basis. He heard Jesus say this. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And he repeats it basically over in 1 John chapter 5, 14 through 15, which is the next one. He says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. You want a formula for success? There you go. There you go. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Well, how in the world are we going to know what his will is? Well, we just talked about that from Romans 12. If we decide that we're going to live as a sacrifice, if we're going to live a life that's holy and pleasing to God, if we will be conf not conformed to this age, but we will renew our mind on a daily basis. All these verbs are ongoing. It is not a one-time thing. Then we will be able to discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Why? Because if we ask anything according to His will, He will hear us. Can you beat that? Now, that doesn't make this verse like a uh, credit card. It doesn't mean that we can just ask for anything we want. Right? It means that we are in a relationship with God, that His Spirit is communing with ours, the presence of the Holy Spirit is working in our lives, and because we are striving to live rightly, a righteous life, we are in so in tune with the Heavenly Father that we can discern His good, pleasing, perfect will. And because we have that knowledge, because we know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, we can go to the Father in prayer, asking Him, and most likely He's probably already granted it anyway. But He loves to hear. And our prayers can be successful because we're praying what God wants us to pray in the first place. We're, 
praying what he wants us to pray. Anyway. But again, the contrast is true. If we're not going to live rightly, there are a few verses that tell us that if we're not going to do that, our prayers are going to be hindered. The first one, okay, watch out, guys. Husband. <laughs> it says, Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs that with you of the gracious gift of life so nothing will hinder your prayers. Guys, we have a tough responsibility. But we've already acknowledged nothing is impossible with God, right? We need to make sure, guys, that our relationship with our wives, families, or what they should be, so that our prayers are not in. Next, Matthew 6, 14 through 15 says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And then we go to the next verse, which I've used before. He says, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. The only way we do not have cherished sin in our heart is that we take care of it. If the Holy Spirit is working in our lives, if we are striving to have this right relationship with Him, we are working on a daily basis to have this personal, intimate, growing relationship with Jesus, that any time there's sin that takes place, there should be an immediate conviction for us to take care of it, to ask forgiveness for it. And the Word tells us that if we do not forgive, we will not be forgiven. So, the sin's not going to be taken care of. Therefore, God does not hear our prayers. Uh, oftentimes, I think, you know, again, we just want to flip through here, and we just want to find those magical verses. We want those Ten Commandment kind of things that, that tell us, if we'll do this, don't do this. You know, it'll work. But we forget that we must take the whole counsel of God's word. There's, there's a lot of situations and things that we're going to go through, we're going to face. That when we try to find out what God's word for it is or what we should do about it, and we try to look for that verse that says, Thou shalt not, or thou should, it's not going to be there. But we can take God's word and we can read through it and based upon what it says and shares, we can make the assumptions, we can make the decision that based upon what I just read and how it all comes together, this is something I should not do. Something I should not do. And we make the sacrifice. Maybe it's not a sacrifice. I mean, maybe it's something that, I mean, it's, we really don't have to give up, but it's something that we have to, to, you know, basically say, Satan, get thee behind me for the moment. You know, we have to put our temper in the check, or we have to make sure that we're patient with those that we're meeting at the grocery line, or, I mean, whatever it may be. We have to do that on a constant, regular so then, we want to have a successful prayer life. When we communicate with God, we want it to be successful. We don't want those prayers to be bouncing off the ceiling or feel like they go anywhere. Then, first of all, let's make sure we have a relationship with God in the first place. And then second, Let's allow the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God to guide us on a daily basis. To help us to be fully devoted followers of Christ. To live a life that is sold out for Him. And though we cannot do it in our own strength, 
We have the power and the presence of God through the Holy Spirit that lives within us to help us do this. So that as we strive for the bright, to not be conformed to this world, but to continue transforming and renewing our minds on a daily basis, that we can discern the good, pleasing, perfect will of our Heavenly Father. And then we can ask anything in His name according to His will. And He says He'll give it. I'll take that gift for you. As the band comes, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do live in a difficult time, a difficult world. And God, as we share today, we physically have to be part of it, unless we want to become nuns or monks or hermits somewhere in a cave or, you know, that, that's just not what we do usually. So God, as we as we live in this world, we are challenged by your word to not be conformed to it. To be different, whole, set apart. And God, that doesn't mean that we're supposed to be holier than thou. It doesn't mean that we're supposed to be unloving. But it does mean when when your word and your ways and your values and your morals and all the things the word tells us are compromised. That we need to, to stay on the right side. And God, it is difficult. So help us. We pray today that you would give us the power, the energy, the courage to do that in our daily lives. But I pray, God, if there's anybody here today that doesn't know you personally, that has never made you part of their life, if they've never come to you, Jesus, into that personal relationship, that today would be the day of salvation for them. And for the rest of us who have done that, God, that you'd help us from this day forward and live more of a godly, right life. Thank you for your mercy that are new each and every day and the love that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll stand, I encourage you to be obedient to God's leading today. I will be down front if you would like to talk.